about 12.01, so I'm gonna get started. Um, hi everyone, I'm Nikki O'Neill. I'm a digital technologies development librarian at NC State University Libraries. Um, oh, good, everyone can hear and see me. Um, I mostly work on coding applications to help librarians with their jobs. Um, some of the ones that you may be familiar with are the textbooks application, which, let's see, I can actually show you. Um, so if you want to, if you need textbooks, this is one of the applications I'm in charge of. Um, you can look up your textbooks for, say, English 101, and it will list them for you. Um, so I, I maintain app this is an application I maintain. Someone else actually built it before I got here. I've been here for about two years um, now. Um, and then I also built applications as well, uh, a lot of which are not front facing uh, and available to students, but uh, some that are. Um, trying to think of some. I do some work on Quick Search, again, which is the search on the, the home page. Trying to think of any front facing ones that I've actually built from scratch. Nothing's coming to mind. Um, so today I'm gonna just do a quick um, introduction to Vue.js and APIs. Um, I have not prepared any kind of code. I'm just gonna actually show you my process going through live coding um, because I think there's some real value in terms of. Uh, showing what I have to do uh, when I'm creating an application. And I think a lot of people don't actually get to see that process and think developers often just go ahead and like start writing things and then it automatically works. That is not the process at all. A lot of the times uh, we fail a lot during our processing and that is actually um, how we make things work and that is failing is a lot of our process. Um, so I'm going to um, go through that process. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera for most of this because uh, I am currently working from home and uh, my experience is my internet service is sketchy at the best of times. So but let me go ahead and turn that off. Okay, um, so first step uh, to creating a view application is uh, a command called view create. So the way to find out how to actually create a view application um, is often starting with Google um, and you'll do Vue.js getting started. Um, and this will often give you the best uh, introduction on how to do things. Um, now we're going to be using Vue CLI, which is the command line version. You can also use Vue just like within your browser. Um, we're going to be using the command line version. So getting started. Um, and then this is actually like how to create like a basic application. Um, I'm going to build... This should be an installation, maybe. Um, but you always have to like go looking. It's never like a quick thing. Um, so I've already done this step with the npm install dash g ucli um, because I've built a number of view applications. So it's already installed on my app uh, on my computer. Um, so now I have to figure out how to create an application, which normally would be somewhere in the documentation. Let's see. And this is like often what I end up doing. It's just like randomly scrolling around until I find the right documentation I'm looking for. Um, looks like I accidentally got to the wrong document uh, an older version of the documentation so this is the installation if you weren't using Vue CLI 
Um, this is after you've had it installed, but there's a way to actually create an application using the command line, which should be located here, I think. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's this view create command. So what I'm gonna do is open, this is an application called Visual Studio Code. Um, and the reason I like it for a lot of my application development is I can view my entire folder and I can also uh, open a terminal, which is nice because uh, normally with a terminal, uh, you have to open multiple windows. So I'm going to create a project called Jeb. I'm not the greatest speller. Jeb uh, Jeopardy. Um, so let's create that. And this is going to actually create all of the materials for UCLI. Um, so we're just going to use the default. Um, and as you can see on this side, it has actually created a new folder called Jeopardy with a um, file and it's gonna keep creating files right here. Yes, oftentimes I honestly don't go through this step. Um, Colin said this is so valuable to see. I always feel like an imposter when I go back to the uh, Google the docs like a billion times. Uh, yes, I often do that or with some of these things, uh, often I won't go through this whole process of view create. I'll actually just copy one of my old view applications and uh, change stuff because um, sometimes that's easier. Sometimes there's like too much stuff to like delete and you will do a view create, but often you go back to your old application and will copy huge swaths of code because it just makes life easier. Um, so it's actually created the entire folder for us and it says uh, successfully created the project. Get started with the following commands, CD Jeopardy, um, which is, I think I spelled Jeopardy wrong, uh, whatever, um, uh, which is just changing it so that we're in the folder. So if you do PWD, it will actually tell you where you are. So I'm in the folder user under my username um, and under projects and under a folder I've titled Twitch stream. So if I change directory to Jeopardy and what I did there, it seemed like I typed really fast. I just hit tab that will auto complete things for you. Um, and then the next command is npm run serve. And when you do this, you will get your application to open at this um, URL. So if I do command click, open the wrong command. If I do command click and, or open it here, this is going to be my view application. <laughs> yes, Jeopardy is a hard one to spell. Um, so if I go into source and then I go into app.vue.js, what I'm saying is, um, I'm going to make this a little bigger, um, is welcome to your Vue.js app and then this tag, which says hello world message equals hello to your Vue.js app. And then in this script tag, you see import hello world from components, which is this folder, hello world.vue.js, and then these components. Um, so one of the nice things about Vue.js is it allows you to use components, which is just like to separate code out. Um, you don't always have to use that depending on like what you're trying to build, but it's really nice if you have something where you wanna reuse it again and again. So like if I copied this and pasted it and changed this to um, example, showing change. Um, 
and saved it. What happens is it rebuilds. And you can see this, uh, the app in the web browser. It's updated to say example showing change. And then this is all been, all this content has been hard coded within uh, the component. So I'm switching over to the Hello World uh, Vue.js component. Um, and if you look in here, the template is all the HTML. So if I were to delete all of this, it's going to reflect in the browser. So as you see, all that went away and now you just have this. Um, and then uh, if you look at this, this is actually just saying uh, the message from here. So this is message equals. Um, and if you go back into the component, this is saying message. So if I wanted to like put um, placeholder right here, it's going to say or placeholder colon message. It's going to update to show placeholder colon message. Um, and you can actually uh, put multiple. So if I wanted to change this to, I want a message plus a number. And I say this is a number and I would define it as an integer. Okay. Um, so this often happens. You have to look things up. So I'm going to look up props, Vue.js types. Um, and if I go into the documentation, you can see, you can actually just list the props and not define a, a type, but often you want to. Um, and so it would be number, not integer. And so I define that as number and I can change this to number. And so what you should What's not, it's not going to show up yet because you haven't actually fed a number in. So right now you're just getting nothing. But if you feed number equals one into there, you will get that one showing up. Um, so this allows you to basically um, feed things over, over, that's what I'm looking for, um, feed things into your, to your components if you have something you need to feed in there. So I'm going to delete this one and uh, we are going to uh, start working with APIs. So let's create a prop that's called API and um, let's see, I am going to define it as the, uh, the URL for this. So we actually go look at this URL. Uh, this is a Jeopardy API. Um, and the way APIs work is basically they're like information being served to you. And I'll show you more about it. The really important thing to understand is APIs often have documentation to define like certain URLs. So if you go to uh, this URL slash clues. Oh, sorry. It should be, uh, the URL should be API slash clues. So if I go there, uh, okay, I put one too many backslashes in there. It's going to give you something called JSON data, which is just, if you look at it, it looks like this. It's a combination of what in coding we call um, arrays and dictionaries. So depending on what language you're in, those terms will change. Really the idea is um, anything with a bracket defines a list, like in the same way you'd write a list for grocery shopping. Um, and anything with this kind of like curly bracket um, defines like a, a key value set. So you have a key that's ID and a value that's two. Um, so, and it will basically, most APIs, at least good APIs, will tell you like what you're going to get out of it. Um, 
So this tells you it's going to give you a value of the clue, the category, the minimum earliest date, maximum date, and offset. So let's see. Let's start working with, yeah. Uh, yes, okay, and these options are actually not just um, what you get out of it. I believe these are also variables. So I think you can define, like if you wanted the value to be $200, I'm pretty sure you can say value equals 200. And yes, all your results should have a value equal to 200. Um, so sometimes you, they don't actually, yeah, this one doesn't tell you what you get back. You just have to like look at the data that you returned. Um, and what I'm using, yeah. Um, uh, Colin just asked you to use a plugin to make that more readable. No, I'm actually using Firefox. Um, Firefox basically has this readableness built in. It's very nice. Part of the reason I use Firefox um, when coding. The other reason, especially with few applications, my browser tends to change based on my application um, in terms of like what framework I'm using. Uh, is it automatically re like it it catches the rebuilds um, and will automatically reload which is really nice um, so we're gonna define an API property and we'll say API and delete this messaging and we'll delete that just getting rid of some stuff and we'll define a property as API and get rid of some of the stuff and when you save it, you can actually see what you're supposed to be able to see, the API. Um, something is wrong. See, this is why it's valuable to see this. Um, so something is not getting fed in correctly. Either that or it was a save problem. Yeah, so there's something where, see how this colon is still showing up? Um, that is a problem. You can also look at the console, which is if you right click and say inspect element, um, the console will give you warnings. So it looks like it still accepts, expects to see a property name number, um, even though I've changed this. So we're going to just try reloading and that solved our problem. Um, so Uh, and then I think I want to get rid of this image because it is annoying. Okay, so now we're feeding the API in, but we want to actually be able to read this API. Um, and this is where the coding actually starts coming in. So um, in Vue.js, let's see, um, I use Axios, um, which is a library. Um, it's a JavaScript library that basically does most of the work for you. Um, instead of having to code a way of like getting data from a URL, it will do all the work for you and you just need to call something. So using NPM, which is what Vue.js uses, I'm going to stop the server and I'm going to install it. So I do NPM install Axios and hit enter. Um, and that's going to actually install everything. Um, one of the nice things about this is you can actually uh, see these things installed. So if you go into this package.json, you can see these dependencies have updated and you can actually see that's Axios. Um, it's also going to be updated in here. This is a bit more involved. You don't actually need to read this as long as it's in the package.json and then you do npm install. So if you need to install like multiple things, you can just add the lines here. So if you wanted to install like four things, you could just do the equivalent, whatever these four things are. You don't want to install the same thing four times. Um, and so you could do that and then run npm install and it would install all these things for you. Um, so we've installed it and uh, this gives us an example of common usage. Um, so basically, 
you can do this. Um, so if I go npm run serve, I'm going to start my server up again. And if I go into my component, uh, in uh, Vue.js, you want to actually put all your imports in this script function, um, like not within the template or the style. Um, and it suggests doing this constant equals axios equals require axios. That works. Um, but what you probably want to do instead, just based on my knowledge of Vue.js, is you actually want to do import axios from axios. Um, that's just the Vue.js uh, more common like standards, and you can look that up and find that um, within the documentation. Um, also within the documentation, so like if you go into the documentation, into, I lost getting started, but let's see, there should be getting started somewhere, introduction maybe, yep, getting started. Um, so basically you can also define, we're going to need this, so I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. Um, this goes, it doesn't really matter what order things go in, but you de do need to put that in there. Um, we're going to need this data function later on, so I'm just going to copy it in now. Um, and then there should be something in the getting started about... There's a function called created. I think it's created. It's either, I think it's, yeah, it's created. Um, this is the problem with like getting to know new applications is you have to go through this whole process. Um, so like my first view application took me like a couple months to like get to the point where I wanted it. Just because you have to learn like a whole new thing. Um, luckily, I have learn this at like this um so it makes things easier for me um so the creative function is basically let me see if i can find the view life cycle um there's like a chart that makes this easier to understand um <laughs> exactly so uh learn a new thing and all the words and jargon to go with it Yes, it definitely takes a lot more time. Um, so there is a life cycle diagram, which makes things easier to understand. Yeah, so there's a new view application, and then you can call a function called before create, which I don't think I ever use. If I do, it's like very rarely. Um, and there's the function created, which we just built right here. Um, and then... This is like a, a, how do I describe this? This is basically like the view application. L is the view application. Um, and so there's also a function called mounted, which is down farther. Um, so sometimes you want mounted. Mounted actually just means that this template has built. Um, so mounted, before mount, mounted. Um, and then before destroyed, destroyed. And this gives you just kind of some information about like the whole life cycle and how it goes through. It's not that important. Really, you just need to know created. So, um, yeah, that's going to cause a problem. Okay, see, here's an example. Uh, we are getting errors already. So, two problems errors warning. Axios is defined but never used. Um, well, I hate when that happens. So we're just going to comment this out for a second so it would stop giving us that. And data, uh, okay, so that documentation is a little wrong and you actually need data to look like this, I believe. No. Okay. And it's giving me a message is defined but never used. So we'll just comment that out. Um, okay, actually, 
data actually needs to look like. And again, I only know this because I've written a good number of Vue.js applications. Pretty sure data needs to look like that. And this is where it comes in handy to just copy things. Um, so now if you look at the console, console.log is a really handy way of just like seeing what's going on. So console.log says a is a colon blank. And um, that is not really uh, useful in any way. It's just showing you like where it shows up. Um, but if we wanted to do this dot API, which um, this is actually just like saying the data, you call this for the application. Um, so this dot API is basically calling this property string of API. But if you just tried calling console log API, it's not going to work. So this is just like a weird, as you can see, you're getting an error. API is not defined. Um, it's just like a weird kind of function that goes along with these applications. Um, oh no, I'm so lost. What does the mean? What does it mean that the template is built? Um, template is this everything between these tags. So it means like the template is showing. It's kind of hard to explain, and it's not really that. I mean, it's sort of useful to know. But like basically, it means the template is showing up on the on the web page. So when the template is built, it's showing up on the web page, um, and that's when mounted is going to happen. So if I do a mounted function, um, and did this, you can actually see. mounted versus the um so it actually happens after and it's it's really hard to tell because it like everything happens within a second so it, like there is no real way to like show you oh the template like there's a lag on template yes the mounted function runs when the page is rendered so yeah um so we don't really need this mounted function right now um but you should be able to see in this console log, we have this this uh, API URL showing up. So um, what we probably want to do is change this to API close because um, that's really the portion we're going to be using for right now. Um, we can revisit like that later on. Um, Normally when you're building an application, you'll have a better idea of like what you want starting out and how you want things to work. Um, since I'm doing this a little on the fly, I have less of an idea, um, but it is a good idea before you start an application to build a wireframe of some sort, um, which for me often all I use is like a piece of paper and a pen and I just sketch out some ideas of like how I want things to work and how I want things to interact. Um, or you can do it in your head, um, but it's good to have like a, a piece of paper and a, a version. Um, so what we wanna do now is actually get the data from this API. So we're gonna go to Axios, which is the way to get information. And basically all we wanna do is just copy this whole thing. Um, and what is happening here, I'm just going to change this a little bit, um, is axios.get, and then whatever's in the parentheses, it's going to get data from that URL. So we want to get the data from this dot API, which is the API URL. Um, and then there's like this whole thing, which makes sense to, I guess, guess developers. I don't know. Um, I am not by training a developer. I was an English lit major in college with a minor in history. Um, I mean, I guess it makes a little sense. And like, once you see it a bunch, you get it, but it's also slightly annoying. Um, this dot then function basically, and then it says function response. Um, 
basically says, like, after you get all the data, then what you need to do is feed this response. And right now it's just sending that response to the console. Now this catch function handles the error. So if there was an error, like the API was wrong, it's going to give you like the error. And then the then function, which is really an optional function, is just executed if you have an error or if you have a success. And if there's something you want to do no matter what, um, then the then function is what you want to use. So if I save this, oh, I have an error. Axios is not defined. Right. I uncommented this. So this is very true uh, to the to the um, process of uh, coding. Like often you uncomment things out and then you don't and uh, you get errors. So uh, it looks like I'm getting an Axios is not defined in the console. So I want to just refresh. Okay, so if you look at the console, what I'm getting is this data, um, which is basically saying config uh, stuff, header stuff, which is just like header information. It's not really that important. Status, which often I use in other applications for things, um, basically gives you the status of the information, but we're, what we're really interested in is the data. So um, response, we're going to change this to response.data. And actually, I'm going to show you, like, if I were to change this to this, I'm not, that actually might work. We're going to try it. Um, yes, you're going to get an error. And so if you look at this console, you're saying hello world view dot view 28. So if you look at this, that is actually this. So you're that is showing you the console log statement. Um, so I'm going to switch this back to this dot API, but basically um, whenever you have like a wrong URL or something that's not working or maybe the URL is down, um, yes. Is the response object considered a list node by any chance? Um, I mean, if you could define list node, that would be great. I, I don't, it is an array or a list if that's um, what you're wondering. Or actually, technically, I think it's a dictionary. Let's see. Let's do console log response. Uh, within JavaScript, it's considered an object. So you can actually see what things are called. So JavaScript objects are key values and arrays are just like lists of things like your grocery list. Um, so uh, it will actually define within the console what something is. So we have a console statement asking for a response and we have a console log statement saying just give us the data. Um, so this is the response and this is the data, which is this field right here, um, which is what we want. So let's say we were building this. So we only want, um, let's see, we're going to define data now. So the nice thing about Vue.js is it allows you to find, uh, define data uh, that you can use like within the whole application. So we're going to say this is a clue. Uh, let's see. Maybe we want to define this as, maybe we just want to start. We're going to start with one clue. So this is clue. And by default, it's going to be nothing. Um, but when we get the data, we're going to set this dot clue, which is again that syntax within view um, that's saying this data function, uh, this value of clue equals response dot data. And we're just going to get the first item in that list. So um, you can define things by getting uh, like if I wanted to get the second item in the list, I'd go, uh, I put in one. So within coding, everything starts at zero. So the first item is zero, a second item is one, so on and so forth. 
Um, so we're just going to get the first item in the list. And then we can do a console statement and just see what's going on. Um, and say this.clue. And it's saying this is undefined. So. <sighs> okay. I have to remember why this is causing a problem. Hmm. This is where our old code comes in. Okay. Uh, list node was an object that I learned as a CSC major were individual components of linked lists like stacks or queues. Um, some one of their states is it? Huh. Um, I'm guessing this is like a list node. Now I gotta look up list node because I'm curious. Uh, list node. Yeah, it sounded like a Java nonsense type thing. No offense. Um, <laughs> but Java is different than JavaScript. Um, Java is a much more like heavy language. Um, yeah, I think list node has got to be like a something that translates to list. I'm not 100% sure. I'm not that from I took one Java class um, when I was an undergrad because I, I had about like 10 majors um, before I finally figured out what I wanted to do. Um, that's not true. I graduated and then I went to graduate school and then kind of figured out what I wanted to do. Uh, it took a while. Um, <laughs> Java is a bit different than JavaScript. Um, they're very different languages. Uh, Java requires compiling, so it, like you have to run like this whole thing where you compile. Um, I honestly just can't answer your question about list node. Um. <laughs> uh, Java nonsense, I'd be completely offended if this were not absolutely true. Yes. Um, so back to the, the this is undefined. Um, so oftentimes what you want to do is you'll just copy this message and Google it. So, view. Um, so, and you might want to put Axios in because it seems like a, like if I go outside of Axios and do a console log statement of this dot clue, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get a, have a problem. Yeah. So, as you can see, uh, view, uh, hello world dot view at line 22, which they're all numbered within uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, that's that statement and it's an empty string, which is correct because that's what we sent it to. Um, and, the, and where we're getting an error is at 30, which is just, we're getting that because there's an error in the code. So within this then response, there's an error, and this catch function is just showing us what that error is. Um, so there's uh, the problem we're having is based on uh, that's what I'm looking for uh, is because of Axios, not because of view. Um, so it looks like I'm glad you Google error messages too. I do it all the time. Yes, that is like 90% of my job. Um, I will counter, however, with the idea JavaScript is a lawless land, conquerable only by the best pioneers, however. And then me too. So obviously we have a bit of two threads going on um, within the chat. Um, so... This is giving us a type error, this.axios is undefined, which is not what we're looking for. Um, can't get it. So I'm just looking through the problems. Um, so yeah, so it looks like someone is trying to trap some network errors and trying to do the same thing we are. And so hopefully someone actually has some helpful responses. Um, 
Okay, so it looks like we're using Axios a little bit wrong. So instead of doing then, so if you can see uh, the difference between this and uh, this, what we need to do in here is replace function with this and so change function, like remove function and then put an arrow after the variable. And let's see if that works. It did. So now we are getting, now we are actually able to set this dot clue um, to response dot data. Now, one of the things I, um, uh, I'm glad to see that people get paid to code also use Stack Overflow and someone said I'd be lost without Stack Overflow. Uh, yes, I would too not want to do this job without Stack Overflow. Um, so what we end up doing uh, is one of the things I it took me a really long time to learn with Axios um, is because Axios works in such a way that um, I think I can just show you. So if I do a console statement after the Axios call, it's actually going to show up uh, before this console statement with this dot clue. So let me actually show you that. So as you can see, after Axios is getting called uh, before this dot clue is showing up. And that's because the way Axios works is like it has to actually get the data. So, and the way view works is like, it's just going to keep going and it's not going to wait for Axios to finish. And it has no way of telling. Now there is a way like with synchrony and some, it's, it's honestly not worth it to go into. Um, really the, the main takeaway for this is you need to, to, um, like do all your data handling within this thin uh, request. So if we want to actually view the clue in here, we can. So as you can see, there is now that clue. And if we refresh it, the clue is actually going to change. So the clue right now is the Atlanta Braves are in this division of the National League. Um, which, is there an answer to this? Ah, the Western Division. It's a weird way things are sorted. Uh, okay, so this is not a random, interesting API. It's good to like refresh things to actually see how um, APIs work. So certain APIs, like it will be like a random. Some APIs are like it's just a list and it's a static list and that list never changes. Um, so this one looks like it's static. And so when you refresh, you're not going to get anything new. Um, does Axios not follow normal time? Uh, not sort of. It, not really. <laughs> um, the way view works is it's like calling Axios is called. And it sees that Axios is called and it moves on to the next thing. Um, it doesn't wait for that then statement to finish like running. Um, so like it just, it, and you can actually like do this in view. It's like, I remember like going through it and it's just long and complicated and it wasn't worth it because of the way view works. Uh, it made more sense to just create a function within here. And especially because, um, like I can load that clue into the template, um, and it makes more sense to, to just do it that way as opposed to like try to get it to wait until the next thing. Um, so let's say we wanted to like actually have this clue show up like where the question shows up and then someone can input an answer. So what we want to do is create, let's call it a div. A div is just a tag with an HTML. Um, there are like multiple div is the one I use the most because it's the most flexible and you can 
um, style it the way you want. And let's say we just do clue dot question. And maybe we want to actually show like how much it's worth and the category. Um, so let's see, you can do category. Um, and if you look at this, it has a category and the category has an ID and a title. We're going to just do the category first and you can actually see more. So as you can see, you have this category has an ID title, create a bunch of data, clues count. Uh, we're just going to go with the uh, yeah, title and the clue dot question. So baseball. We also might want to put in the how much the clue was for. So if I go back and look at the clue data. Okay, see. Uh, view clue dot category is undefined. Okay. I can tell you why that happened. Um, but first let's get the value, which is clue dot value. Um, so the reason this happened is because before, so you're going to still see this error. You're going to get this error. Clue.category is undefined. And the reason it's undefined is because when the page first builds, um, it's looking at this clue, which is equal to nothing. Um, so it's going to build the template once. And then it's going to build it again when this value updates. So what we want to do is do an if statement, which is to say if there is a clue. Um, and do you often do front end development, page development work as your main gig? Uh, I want to say it's about 50 50. Um, I do a lot of back end development as well. It depends on the application I'm working on and the purpose. So let's see, there's an application I work on that specifically processes AV materials. Um, and that application is like 70, 30 in terms of like work. So the application is a, is a Ruby on Rails application. Um, and so a lot of that is like backend stuff and all the processing of AV materials, which is like, we take the AV material and we, create a, a derivative of it in mp4 so let's say we got uh, the material and originally mkb we'll convert it to an mp4 format and we'll also um we'll also create automatic captioning um for those files and create some sprites which are just like you know, on Netflix where you hover over like a, a spot on the video and it shows you a picture. That's what a sprite is. And we create a poster. Um, so most of that is like a backend is used with Ruby on Rails in the backend framework. Um, but once we have all that data, I actually feed it into a view uh, component to actually be, build like the view so you can actually see all that content. Um, so yeah, it's about 50-50. Um, I think, but depending on the project, it might be 70, 30, or it might be a hundred zero depends on the project and like what the purpose is. And often times I have to figure out like, what is the best framework for the application? Like what makes the most sense? Um, if anything has a database on it, you're gonna have a lot more backend work, um, than front end work. Um, if something has like any kind of thing where you have to log in, you're not going to use a front end framework for that at all. So just depends. Um, so if you can see with the v.if, which again is view syntax, view syntax, which is saying if a clue exists, then build everything out. Um, so we are no longer getting that error. And again, if you tried building a view app, do not expect it to be this fast. I have been working with you for, let's see, a year or two, I think. I, I didn't start actually using view until I came to NC State. Um, my previous position did use a, a framework very much like view, though, called Angular. 
um, which I do not like compared to Vue. Um, and Angular uh, is very similar. So I have experience with this and I wouldn't expect to jump in and just get it. Um, let's see. Do you usually work on individual products or in a collaborative role with other team members? Uh, again, both. Um, so um, some projects I'm working collaboratively, uh, some projects I'm working collaboratively with other librarians, so it's not just me, um, which is nice, but there are some projects, especially like some of my more passion projects, where it's just me and I don't, I, I mean, I ask my colleagues, hey, do you want to take a look at this? And if they have time, they'll take a look at it and give me their feedback. But um, yeah, again, it, it depends on the project. So we go to lib.ncsu.edu and search a book or an article. So let's say we're searching for Python. Um, this application was actually built by one of my very talented colleagues, uh, Kevin, who works in my department. Um, he built that, but I actually built the little module for workshops, which if you didn't know, that's actually there. Um, and we work with a team of other librarians who go through and ask for like different things to be added in, or, um, once we add things in, we'll go over that and see like what works and what doesn't. Um, so again, depends on the project. This is one of our larger projects. So this has a lot more input. Um, Yes. Okay. Um, back to this. Okay. So as you can see, we have baseball. Let's say maybe we want to change this and do baseball for, and then the clue value, you can do that. So baseball for a hundred. Um, the Atlanta Braves are in this division of the National League. And so maybe we want like someone to be able to answer this question. Like maybe we want to do random Jeopardy questions and then people can answer them. So input is a HTML. I always forget what the input. I think it's just that. Yeah. Uh, is an HTML. Now I have to look it up. I always forget with HTML and input. Um, how the way the tag is supposed to be formed. Okay. It's just like this. So most tags need to have like a closing tag. See, this label tag has a beginning tag and a closing tag. Input doesn't. And I always forget if there's a some tags without a closing tag just have a slash at the end. Input doesn't. So input basically allows users to input a value. So let's say value. Um, now with view, the nice thing about view, I have to say, is... Um, Yes, JService has a random endpoint, and we are going to go to that um, next. So uh, Vue has a very nice thing called the model. And you can define, so I want to say within data, I'm going to define something as input, which is equal to this. And V model will basically take in, uh, that data and update it. So if I say v model equals input, uh, then it's going to update this. Uh, update this. So like if I said input equals um, default input and save it, what you're going to actually see is this input value is going to equal default input. So it's really nice. So if um, I want to create a function. So within Vue.js, actually, I think it's this. Let me look it up again. Um, so methods are like basically the the wrapper for yes, defining functions. So so methods is just this, and don't forget your commas, otherwise you're gonna have problems. So if I wanted to do a method of check answer function, um, and we're going to just do a console statement of this.input, um, 
And the other nice thing about view is we can do the on, which is basically saying on. Um, and this is something I also have to look up. Uh, view input on enter. We want to do enter, not on change. So basically, there's a way to say like when something uh, is submitted. Looks like this one's saying use form. I think I just want to use input. Um, yeah, looks like V key up on enter. You can call a function, which our function is check answer. Okay. Um, so if I were to update this to, uh, I don't know, baseball with that. As you can see within this console we have baseball at hello world 26 and if we look at 26 that is this dot input. So I'm going to change this input back. Um, so like if we wanted to check this dot clue um, and I think the, we're going to just do this dot clue because I don't actually yeah it's answer. So this dot clue dot answer it looks like I have I want to get rid of that random console statement in there. So if I want to check these against each other, so enter baseball again, and the answer is the Western Division. So I could do uh, if this dot input equals this dot clue dot answer. Um, we could set something to let's say message. Um, this dot message equals correct. And we could do another uh, uh, variable which says uh, if message Let's just display this message. Um, and maybe we want to do an else statement, which basically says uh, is equal to incorrect. Try again. So if we do baseball, going to give you that message. Incorrect. Try again. Um, would we need to update the check answer method to handle answers with different phrasing? Like if the user type, what is the Western division or who is the Western division? Um, yes. <laughs> to stay true to Jeopardy fashion. Yes. Um, so there are a number of things you want to do. So like if I were to type in the Western division, which is correct, but my capitalization is different, I'm going to get this incorrect try again message again. It's not updating to say that is correct. So what we want to do uh, is uh, say like maybe we want to define a uh, cleaned input is equal to this dot input dot it's to lowercase. I gotta look this up. It's different based on, so like in Python, it's dot lower parentheses, but it's different based on um, the, the, yeah, it's to lowercase. Um, based on uh, the, and based on, uh, lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, it's different based on what language you're using. Uh, and we'll do cleaned uh, answer is equal to this dot clue dot answer dot two lowercase. Um, and then we can change this to cleaned input equals cleaned answer. Uh, and save that. So if I put in the Western Division again without the same uh, 
uh, like the correct, uh, or if I did like division and I don't know, W capitalized, I'm still going to get that correct answer. Um, now there are ways like where you can do like who is the Western division or what is the Western division. Um, that is where regex 101 would come in. Uh, I often use this tool because it's very helpful. Um, so you could do like uh, who, what, where, um, is, and then what is, and I always, I'm not good with regex. I always have to look it up. There it is. You, and then who is, and you could like do a regex search to find these like specifics um, and replace them. I'm not going to do that right now because, mm, nah, we're going to move on. Um, question, does Vue have a method in its API to recognize all forms of string input? Um, that a user types in terms of capitalization. Does you have any method? Um, I'm not sure I understand this question. Um, are you asking? Like, does view recognize capitalization? Because it, it does based on... Yeah, I, I, I honestly, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to ask. Um, hmm. I mean, it recognizes capitalization. I tend to lowercase everything because people capitalize things in different places. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so... Uh, now we might want to move on to like doing a random clue. So we can change the API to J. Um, so let's go back to the API page. Um, so you could do api.random. So if I go into this app.view and do random instead and save it and refresh the page, it's going to give me a different clue. And it's just going to keep giving me random clues every time I refresh it. Um, so this is Gwyneth Paltrow, I think. Let's see if I'm right. Oh, spelled her name wrong. I need to look up how to spell her name. Like I said, I'm not the best speller. Ah, I had something switched. And I was correct. Um, so from there, I might want to, I don't know, actually build like a full Jeopardy board. Um, so maybe you want to have like multiple clues. So what you could do is like, we wouldn't want to use random, I don't think. Let me see. What is the best way to do this? Um, so we could do random. I don't think that would work great. Let's just go back to using API slash clues. Um, so maybe we want to get like four clues. Um, so what we're going to do is change the way the clue is formed. So we're going to make clue, um, or we'll just change it to clue, and we'll do clues and do a list of clues. Um, and then what we can do is there's actually a way in JavaScript to form a random number. So it's called math.random, and I always forget what it's called. So if I do this, you're going to actually see it's just going to create a random variable. Yes, I always forget it's always a decimal, so you need to multiply it by 100. 
And so, as you can see, it's random, 58, 95. It's just going to randomly, um, it's going to be a random variable. And we're going to actually want to make this an integer. Right now it's a decimal, so we're going to do parse int. That's right. Yep, so then we get 25. Um, so, we, I think we're going to want to make, Would category be the best way to do this? Um, that is not a bad idea. Uh, let's see. We could do category, but that would require, like, uh, yeah, let's do category. Um, okay, so if you did slash API slash category, what you're going to actually, you're going to end up with an error because this one requires you to do an ID. So we can actually, yeah, let's do a random number ID. So you can do ID equals 30. So, um, so we can do a random number ID and that would choose the category and it gives us all the clues. So that's actually really nice. Sometimes it does not do that um, with APIs and you have to make a second call to get the clues. And you say, okay, I'll get me all the clues with this ID. This does this for you. So let's do, um, let's see, number, um, number equals this. And then we're going to say, um, we'll go back into our app.view and change our API URL to this. Um, and then ID equals. And save that and then we're gonna change Axios get to this API plus random number and we'll set this clues equals to response dot data dot clues and save it see what happens and another error a uh, parsing error missing semicolon so um, so if you actually look at this error, you're going to see there is a caret that points to the line where the problem is. So that's 30. Um, it's not 30. 39.52. Um, it's a little hard to read these. Um, but it actually like points out the code. So it's a problem with my constant random number. Um, let's see. Parsing error missing semicolon. Hmm. Well, I'm going to add semicolons here because I forgot to add them. Um, but let's see. What could be the problem? Well, when you run into this, sometimes it's nice to just comment something out. You're going to have a problem where random number is not defined, but we'll just change this to random number equals three and see if that's okay. So this works in the sense that you're not getting an error anymore. So there must be something wrong with my random number code. So let's try removing, I think there might be an yeah, there was one too many parentheses. Um, and so if I update this, we're no longer getting any errors, which is great, but we're also not seeing anything. Um, little red, yes, very good. Um, someone said little red squiggly under the last parentheses on the constant random number line, which is yes. Um, how would we handle categories of video questions that rely on the constant visual seeing of a video clue to answer the questions? Um, I think they, that the question would have to include like a URL to the video and we'd be able to handle that. So we'd check to see is there a like video URL and then embed it in something called a video tag which just looks like. Uh, this just video surrounded by brackets 
and then you put the URL to that video in. And the person would have to play it. Um, I wouldn't expect to like autoplay, especially because I find autoplay is annoying for a lot of people. Um, so, okay, so back to the code. So we're not seeing anything. And the reason we're not seeing anything is because we're basing our view if is on clue and we change this variable to clues. So let's change this to clues.length because if you do clues, um, it's actually going to load. As you can see, you're getting in that error again because clues is a empty variable, but it is a variable. Um, so if we do length is greater than zero, that is going to get rid of that error for us. But the problem is we're still getting an error because we're still calling on clues. So what we want to do is create a new variable and within um, view, you can do a for loop, which just loops through variables. So we're going to say for clue and clues. And we need to close that loop with a closing tag. So I'm just going to tab it in so you can kind of see. Um, so we're going to say uh, for clue and clues, do this like basically what we had before. And another error. Um, okay, so elements in iteration uh, expect to have the vbind key directives, which just means we need to do this. Uh, vbind key equals clue dot, I think clue has an ID, so we'll do ID. Uh, clue dot category is undefined, so we're having another error. Um, so let's look at, I'm just going to comment everything out here and do clue. See what that looks like. Okay. So there's something here, but it looks like, yes, because we have a new data structure, um, there is no category. So we still have a category ID and a value. Um, so let's go back to getting the data. So we're just getting the, the, the response.data.clues. So let's look at response.data as a whole. If you actually look in here, there's the clues, which is what we're loading, and it gives you a count of the clues. So we're actually going to have 75 clues. And well, I guess we won't because we're using random um, when we refresh. And there's the title. So let's set a variable as um, we can, let's actually do this way. Um, let's say this dot clues. Let's see, how do we want to do this? Let's just do a new variable. Let's call it category equals response dot data dot title. And we're going to define it in this data function as well. Um, and I think we're going to want to change this. So we're going to want to change, we're going to show the value, but we're going to do an overarching of uh, category. Oh, something I did not mention is you don't call this within the, within the template tags. Um, so anything that you normally call this within these script tags, you don't call within this template. So you're just calling category. If you try doing this dot category, you're going to get an error. Um, so I guess you don't. Sometimes you get an error. I think it depends. Um, most of the times when I try it, you definitely get an error. So I can't answer that. Um, so now you can see this is, let's just add some tags on this. Um, the, the category is fashion. Name an island for these 1950s shorts, which are fashionable again. So, and as you can see, if I type in Bermudas, we have a problem because our input is defined um, as one variable. 
So this is a problem from our old, um, our old way, but we can very easily change this. So um, V bind. Uh, would you mind explaining what V bind does and why it's necessary to include? Honestly, not 100% sure. Um, I think it just like kind of tells you like this, like when you're iterating, it's nice to have like a, a way of knowing that something like what version you're on. From what I can tell, VBind just like lets, um, like lets things differentiate each other. So when you're iterating, it's, um, nice for the code to like basically be able to say, well, okay, this isn't like, th these are not all the same. We're not one blob. I think you can actually see it. Yeah, a little bit in here. So within the inspector, you can look at like all your HTML. Um, so basically, as you can see, these have like different numbers. Or no, they don't have different numbers. Um, yeah, I honestly, I know I always get that error and I just do what it tells me. Um, I can look it up, but honestly, I've never been that curious. Um, so, yeah, I think it just keeps track. Um, let's go back. Okay, so we're running into a problem where basically we're saying this input is the same. Um, that's why it's answering the same question across these. We want to differentiate this. So what you can do is for clue index includes, and we're gonna change input to a list. Um, we're gonna do vModel equals input uh, and we're going to say at index. Um, so basically this will create a list. I'll show you what that looks like. So when we check our mess or check our answer, um, oh, and we're going to want to define check answer with index. Um, so we're going to say, we want that index variable to get loaded into here. So I'm going to show you what index looks like, and I'm going to show you what uh, this dot input looks like. Um, okay, so if I were to enter, I honestly don't know how to answer this question. Um, What's this, 1984? I'm embarrassing myself, the wrong answer. Okay, so what this looks like, hmm, it's weird, that should be happening. Um, right. Okay, I thought about this wrong. That's what that's happening. Um, so what you're getting is the index is one and you're actually getting a weird, oh, empty slot. Okay, actually I did not think about this wrong. Okay, so if I were to say input at this index, uh, four little words carried on all your mm, currency where you can find Lincoln's name on front and back. Let's say $5 bill. Um, as you can see, the index is zero and $5 bill is the input, which is what we want to get. So we want to actually change this to input at index. And what is this? Yeah. So the reason this dot input is no longer a function is because we're not getting a string. We're getting a list. Oops. Um, so this is Moby Dick. And this dot clue dot answer is undefined because again, the clue is nothing and we have a clues field. So you need to do clues at that index as well. So, um, 
A typical snowflake has this many sides. I do not know the answer to this. <laughs> um, okay. Common element whose refined form, um, I think this is iron. Ah, oh, look at that. I was correct. Um, oh, let's see. Snowflake has six minutes. Okay. And that is also correct. So now we're actually like being able to answer questions and do it based on like area. So you can answer, oh, but we're having this message problem again. So it's saying everything is correct. I don't even know if six was correct. Um, so we have to fix that as well. So we no longer want to do a message. Um, and then we have to think about how we want to do this. Um, so do we want to do like a list the same way we've been doing or is there something else we want to do? Um, so let me think. Hang on a minute. Um, no. Yeah, we might want to do like a message list. That could get difficult though. Because you'd have to, hmm. because of the way lists work, you can't, like, it wouldn't allow you to jump around. It expects you to do things in a certain way. So, let me think. There'd be another way to do this. Yes. Okay. Um, so, we're going to define clue.message, and we're going to do clue.message. And what you can actually do is change uh, this dot clues at index and give it a message. And this dot clues at index and give it a message. And that should work. Um, okay, that is a weird problem. I'm guessing the problem is there are, I think it's something with the API, but unfortunately it's not something I can check because I did not keep that random number in the console. So when getting a URL, it's often good to, to continue to be able to save that. Um, this is a part time. And there we go. Okay, so it's not updating the way it should be. Um, iron as the term. Do we want the for loop to be routine for what looks like every category? Uh. It's actually repeating for every clue, not every category. Um, it does not have multiple categories displayed. These are clues for the same category. So the API we're getting is getting the clues, at least unless this API is, no. Uh, we're using API slash category and you get an ID for one category. So every time we get it, it's just one category. We get multiple clues. Um, so the problem we're having, and I remember why we use vBind, um, is actually to keep track of things. Um, so it's saying like when this key changes, we want to update uh, the template. So we're going to change the key to message. Um, and hopefully that should solve our problem. This is uh, all of me, I'm pretty sure. My mom had me watch that. Okay, so it's not working. So let's go into check answer and see what our 
cleaned input looks like and we're going to check what our cleaned answer looks like and let's also look at this dot close at index and see what that looks like um A new line. I'm pretty sure this is pos -lit. Okay, so novice. Okay, so there is a message. So the problem we're having with this message is for some reason this template is not seeing that something has changed. Um, so I'm gonna, I've had this problem before and I never remember why it is. Um, so UGS template not updating. That's what we're going to look. Um, and let's go look at Stack Overflow and ask us, tell us why. Yeah, so the key part should have worked. That's what I thought it was. Um, maybe... Did I define it as messages? No, nope. message. Hmm. Um. Um, hmm. so I have to keep looking. Um, let me try refreshing. This is PETA. Ah, well, they're trying to tell me that's incorrect because of a PETA. Um, that is one of the things I will say, like, if I had more time, what I'd do is like do some like cool, I mean, there are a lot of things I'd do with more, I'd have more time. Like I'd create a whole board, I'd create them where they flip, I'd create them where you'd only have like a hundred through, what is it, like a thousand or something? I never remember, um, with Jeopardy. Um, like there are a lot of things I'd do that have multiple categories, but of course we do not have time for that. Um, but I'd also do some stuff where like, if something started with A, you'd remove that. Um, there's like some cool data cleaning type things you can do. Um, so the message is updating, it looks like. Um, even though it's telling me PETA is incorrect versus a PETA. Um, but I need to figure out why the data is not updating. So. Uh, let's look in some more. Um, so reactivity in depth. Ah, right. I remember. So even though I've updated the key with view, if you're doing something that's kind of nested, which this is, you need to do this dot set, and then you need to do this clues. Um, and then the index and message, um, and then set the variable. And I'm pretty sure this is what will hopefully fix it. But again, this is coding, so it could be that I'm just going to have to try another thing. Um, but let's see if this works. Um, and I will be uploading this to a GitHub repo that I will share. So if you want to like be able to use this later. Um, I don't know any of these and okay. So we can figure out what's going on with the API now that we have API category ID equals 64. Um, yeah, so it looks like some of these, there's a problem with the API. The question is nothing. Like, there's no question. They give you an answer, but what is, 
but what is and that's why we're having this weird thing show up where there's just inputs for nothing um see these two have inputs for nothing so we can do a if statement um so div the if equals um clue dot question um so it'll only show up if there is a question and that will solve this problem um but will it solve the problem we're having um of the like error or the correct not correct um so this is titanic uh and it just disappeared so that's not good so something went wrong so oh i did okay so this is where console statements are very helpful um if you look at i have this dot clues dot index i set something wrong so i think what needs to happen is i set it um because clues are now equal to message which is not what you want um so i'm pretty sure the problem is um there's definitely something wrong here because you can tell by the the highlighting i've done something oh there's that here we go um okay so hopefully this should update correctly so it looks like i needed to set this clues in the index variable there um and because it was setting this variable to message so i was doing something wrong in terms of setting um so let's try the sand okay so and my correct is showing up now so um oh i think the empty questions are the video questions that is quite possible um so you'd think they'd include something like like a link to the video but i guess they might not have that um love console statements would not have the motivation to debug without them that is correct um so yeah now we have like a working application now granted if i had more time this would be like a lot prettier and more fun um but it looks like we're running low on time so i'm actually going to show one of the cool things you can do with the view application which is actually if you do view run build it'll actually create this into a website um so right now it's building the application this is giving me weird console statements because if i try reloading it there's nothing there um i'm gonna go to github.com actually i'm not logged in on this browser and create a new repository and the repository name is gonna be um twitch stream um and it's gonna be public um let's add a readme file um let's add a get ignore because those are really useful and you can actually choose which one you want um looks like they don't have view built in but they have visual studio so we'll go with that um also licenses are really nice um let's go with an mit license i don't really need it for this project but it's kind of nice to show so there we go i have the code loaded here so what you actually if you look in here you have um it's building for production and if you look it actually creates files in this uh dist folder so if i do command click it's actually gonna open it oh i did not want to open it here i wanted to open it in my finder um because i'm using a mac um but basically it creates these files so if you look in the dist folder you're gonna have um here feel and find it uh in the disk folder you're going to have a css folder a javascript folder 
in an index folder. And what happens is you can actually upload, I'm going to upload all this. Um, I think, you know what, I, I want to upload the code too. So we're going to actually uh, upload the code to GitHub uh, along with the actual build. Um, so we're going to copy this um, to a folder called docs. So one of the nice things about um, GitHub is there's something called GitHub pages and GitHub pages will actually host your application. So at the end of this, there's actually going to be a URL that you as users can go to and play with this. Um, but we can't, well, maybe we can set it to this. We're going to hold off on this copy this. Um, we're first going to push everything to GitHub. Changed my mind. Sorry about that. Um, so GitHub push uh, to new repo. Um, so yes, here are the commands you need. Uh, GitHub add all. Uh, the period is just adding everything in this folder. Uh, so if I do git status, what got added was everything, the package, the source, and the components, which I think is, yeah, these are the things you want added. There are certain things that you don't, or that don't need to get added. Um, I'm guessing the git ignore is telling it not to add them. Yeah, it's telling you not to add the disk or the node module file, which you don't want to add. So we're going to commit and call it our first, first commit. And then we need to add a remote, which is this. Get add remote origin, and then we need to go to this URL. Um, and then we get push or, or actually we're going to want to pull first because they're actually files. So we're going to, oof. And you know what? They've changed everything to main, which is good because we should not be using um, wars of enslavement for coding. There's no need for it. Um, and we're going to go push origin main. see where's the problem it looks like it didn't actually pull everything so let's see ah fatal refusing to merge unrelated histories so I should have just done everything beforehand but eh, you get to see me solve another problem okay looks like that is and everything has is out of date based on GitHub's old version. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Uh, let's say accept current change. Um, and we need to fix this. So let's say accept current change, which is just going to accept. Uh, it's not going to take basically. Uh, the stuff that's coming in from the main and that license isn't having a problem. So it's going to tell you what files are having a problem. And then the other nice thing is um, Visual Studio Code is just going to like show them and you can just choose which ones you want. So it's saying readme has a problem and get ignore has a problem. So we're going to do another git status and add those files. this uh, merge and now we're gonna push origin name okay for some reason it thinks this branch is master so we're gonna check out to the main branch and now we'll try pushing origin there we go so as you can see there's a public folder there's a source folder with all these files um, and all these things. Okay, so what we need to do um, 
out of curiosity, what happens when you add the disk files or the known module files? Uh, nothing. It, uh, the node module files. Um, nothing. It just gets put on your GitHub repo. Um, the disk files, we actually might want to push, though we probably want to rename it. Maybe we'll we'll do disk. Let's see what happens when we change the, the git ignore to allow disk. So I'm removing that. Um, it doesn't do anything, but it also is like not useful. Um, and then if someone tries to download your code, those node file, node module files are just the files you've installed. So they might end up having some problems and have to delete it anyway. Um, so you're just basically like uploading something that's not very useful to anyone, um, which we try to avoid. Um, so let's add that get ignore file because we've removed that disk file. Um, and now you can see that disk file is showing up an untracked file, so I can add that as well. And I'm going to do another commit. And we're going to push it to main. And what you should see when I refresh the page is that disk file is in there. You can actually see the history and see like all the files that got changed when you add the disk file. Um, and let's go into settings and GitHub pages. You can set the source as the main branch. And so the problem with this is we're actually going to want to rename it to docs. So we can update that git ignore to do remove dist um, and change it to docs. So let's just add that git ignore back in. Um, unfortunately, you, you're really going to have to um, remove dist to like remove it from the repo. So I'm not going to bother with that right now. So I'm going to copy dist to docs. Mm, okay, I need to do it recursively. Um, that's just saying like basically you can take all the files within this file and copy it to another file. So if you look in the sidebar, now I have a file called docs with everything that was in dist. So I'm going to add that. Get add docs. As you can see, there's new files. Um, and if I go into this GitHub, you can see there's that docs folder. So now if I go back into settings and go to the pages tab, um, which is new, it used to just be in settings. Um, and go main branch and select docs and save that. I'm actually going to have a site published at uh, dnoneal.github.io slash twitch stream. I'm going to send that out. Um, now it's still building, which is why um, you're getting uh, this. Uh, site not found pages. So still saying the site is ready to be published. So it's going to take a while for, um, there we go. So once it's green, it says the site is published. You can actually go to it and our app is not loading. So why is that? Um, oh, okay. So the problem with this is uh, it's not, it's looking for my base, it's not finding, okay. So this URL is actually located, let me just show you. Um, so it can't find that URL. And the reason it's having that problem is because it really needs to have that, that piece of the URL that it's not gonna find. So you actually have to set this. Um, so it's missing this Twitch stream part. So that actually needs to get set in the app. Um, so set, I think it's public path, um, Vue.js. Um, so you have to go into, uh, let's see, config I think, yes. So this module.exports allows you to set a number of presets. 
Um, so if you set public path, um, and we're going to do what they're doing here, which is basically saying if it's production, put uh, the public path is going to be this uh, Twitch stream. Otherwise, um, do no public path. And the reason we're doing this is because if we didn't do this and we did like this, when I do an npm run serve, what's actually going to happen is, ah, I forgot a comma. I forget the comma. Um, unknown option public path. I don't think I'm supposed to set it here. Uh, let's see. I think this might be for a different file. Yeah, so I need to set this in view.config.js. So I need to create a new file. Um, new file called view.config.js and put this. It's copying all this into here. And we can save that. And we need to get rid of this. Um, so when I do that, and I've set this to test, if you look in this view right here, after it's loaded, it's going to tell me to go to localhost colon 8080 slash test. So if we didn't set this node um, environment, node environment equals production, it's just going to have that Twitch stream always there. Um, and like, that's fine if that's how you want to set it up, but it is nice to just be able to go to localhost 8080 um, when you're in development and not have to remember to put that, that uh, extra part of the URL on. So we're going to run a build. Um, and we're going to, let's see. We're going to uh, do what we did before copy recursively everything in disk to docs. Um, and we're going to also add, oh, it looks like what actually happened is we copied file called, yeah. Um, we copied the disk folder into docs. So what actually we needed to do was just everything into docs. And we're going to go ahead and remove doc slash dist. Um, so, yeah, our files got updated. So we're going to add docs in there. Um, we're also going to add our view.config.js file because that's new. Um, and we're going to go ahead and commit those files and push them again. So we're going to update docs. And we're going to push that to our main branch. Um, now, what's going to happen is the site is going to rebuild. And sometimes it can take a minute. So as you can see, I'm still getting those errors. Um, now I'm not getting errors. Nope, still getting errors. Um, so it hasn't rebuilt fully yet. Let's try this in another browser. Or maybe it has. Nope, still having problems. So it's taking a while to rebuild. Though I will say one of the nice things about Git is, um, it allows, um, like when you push something, it automatically rebuilds your site. Um, so now we're having a problem where it won't allow adding mixed content. And I should have realized this was gonna happen because, no, I used HTTP as our, um, as our API. So, and our website is HTTPS. Um, see how there's an HTTPS? 
It does not like um, loading HTTPs with HTTPSs. That never works. It always causes problems. So we need to go back and fix that in source component uh, app. Let's change that to HTTPS. And we're going to have to rebuild this. And this is actually pretty common. When you're deploying, you definitely don't ever deploy and have it just work. <laughs> GitHub seems super picky. That's actually just an HTML problem. Uh, HTML and that's like an Axios thing. Um, they do not like, like in general, any HTTP versus HTTPS will not allow. Don't like it. Um, that's like not a GitHub thing. That's a, that's just a, uh, we're going to add the docs file. Um, and I don't know if you guys have noticed, um, but we keep getting new JavaScript files every time. So I'm going to just show you while this rebuilds. Um, if you look in the code, Uh, and you look in the JavaScript folder, um, new JavaScript files basically just keep popping up. Um, the chunk vendors stay the same, but these app files just keep changing. There is a way in, um, in this view.config file where you can actually set it so that the JavaScript file that gets created is not like some random number. It just stays the same every time. Um, if you're going to deploy to GitHub, that's normally what you want to do. And you can actually see like the, the status of our site build by this little dot. So it looks like the site has been rebuilt. So let's see if this goes away. And there we go. So now our site is working at dnoneal.github.io slash twitch stream. Uh, and it's working. And you can edit it if you want. Um, so it looks like we have like seven minutes left. So I'm just going to show some cool, like right now it's not very pretty. Um, the cool thing about this is you can also update the CSS. So let's say I want to define, right now this class is hello. We're going to say this is, a, this is not. Um, we're going to want to change this class to clue. Um, so classes work where you can define like the same thing. Um, so if we wanted to say clue and say um, maybe uh, color equals blue. And I need to go back to my local because this is uh, Obviously, it changed the color. So maybe you want a border so it actually looks like a box. So we'll make it solid black. So you can actually put borders around these, and maybe you want them to display like as a grid. So we could do, um, let's see, we'll use the class hello and uh, display grid. Um, uh, normally you can get, let me, CSS is always something you have to look up. Um, so. Oh, there we go. Let's see if that works. That did not work. Okay. Ah, sorry. That was a placeholder. Let's see what this does. Okay, well, we do not want it to look like this, but... Let's see. If we do auto, 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 we might get a three-grid system. There we go. It's a little better. Um, unfortunately, it's doing everything in there, so we want to do hello.clue. So only things in a clue end up in this grid. Mm, 
and that's actually doing everything in the clue. And we just want it to do the clue as a whole. And I have to do that. Hmm. I'm not very familiar with grid, so it's something you just kind of have to play around with. Um, so people are talking about their hated, they do not like Dr. Oz and Aaron Rodgers seems decent. Personally, I really want LeVar Burton to host, but I'm also a kid who was born in the 90s and grew up on PBS. So, um, I'm all about reading Rainbow. Um, let's see. So, honestly, CSS is often just like playing around with things and seeing how they work. Um, so, and play around. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, three column rows. CSS. See if we can get something like that. Um, yeah, that's the type of thing I'm looking for. So let's see. This is saying uh, you just set, oh, we may, maybe we didn't want to go grid. We wanted to go table. So let's say, um, and I will say, like, I definitely recommend W3 schools, like, just uh, ability to play around. So this is nice because you can, like, change things. So, like, what if I change, like, you can see what happens when you change things. So what if I change this to 20? What happens? And you can see it shrinks things. Um, so we can go back to 33. And what if I change, what does padding do? Well, I can show you. So that's what it looks like with 40. This is what it looks like with 20. So padding kind of moves things around. You can change height. Um, it just allows you to play around with this kind of playground. So um, let's try what happens when we display it in a table. Okay. Um, and let's change the width to 30%. And That kind of worked. Not really. Um, but yeah. And so there are like a bunch of CSS things you can do to make it look pretty. Um, I'm going to get rid of that. Um, but yeah. So there are other things. If anyone has any questions, I'll stick around. But that's about it. Uh, Claire says that site came together so quickly. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't expect it to normally go this quickly. Then again, you can totally steal all this code. Um, I'm making it available. So uh, if you go to github.com slash d-n-o-n-e-i-l-l slash twitch stream, uh, t-w-i-t-c-h-s-t-r-e-a-m, uh, you can actually download all this code and like play around with it um, and edit it yourself. So oftentimes it's nice to just have someone else's code to go off of and then you don't have to like go through all like the process of the like basic process we went through. Okay, well... Uh, last call for questions, um, and then I'm going to stop the stream. Um, well, thank you for everyone who showed up today. 
Um, it was great. Um, I had a really nice time. Um, and I hope everyone has a good day.